Hello everyone, one more minute to give time to everybody to get in, can we start? Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on virtual mobility organized by Swiss Next Brazil, which is a platform of Switzerland State Secretariat for the Exchange of Knowledge and Ideas in Science, Education, Research and Innovation. It's organized in partnership with Oikos International, a student-led organization focusing on empowering students to transform economics and management education. This webinar is enabled by Movesia, Swiss Agency for Exchange and Mobility. My name is Charlotte. I represent Euraxis in Latin America and the Caribbean. Euraxis is a European Commission initiative promoting researchers' mobility. I'll be your moderator today, and I have practical information for you. For the Portuguese-speaking audience, Para ouvir a tradução simultânea do webinar em português, vocês podem clicar no globo que aparece na, em, na barra inferior da tela do Zoom, certo? You will receive a recorded version of this webinar in a follow-up email in the coming days. It will also be available on Swiss Next Brazil's YouTube channel within one or two weeks. Please, if you have any question, uh, type them in the Q&A section of Zoom mentioning your name and country and to whom your question is addressed. Well, welcome to the audience who has just joined this webinar on virtual mobility initiatives and best practices. I am very happy to welcome our distinguished speakers from mobility agencies and association from China, Ms. Chen Chesong, from Switzerland, Lauren Redding, from Brazil, Patricio Marinho, and the representative of a non-formal education institution, Hael Ashwande, and a representative of the European Association of Distance Teaching Universities, George Ubax. Well, there is not a unique definition of virtual mobility, but at preparing this webinar, my colleagues considered that virtual mobility was referring to the academic experiences of students abroad with the support of information and communication technologies. Let's watch a, a short video first to illustrate a virtual mobility exchange between Chinese and Brazilian students. So maybe we can watch the movie in a minute. I'm very curious about the educational system and college access examination. So can you tell me something about this? Okay. Uh, actually, here in Brazil, we do three years of high school. Three years. We 
like it was a lot of fun. Um, the benefits of distance learning are, un are undeniable, even more in the current situation when physical mobility suffered a dramatic slowdown, right? But mobility is a much wider experience uh, than only distance learning. And this is the topic that we want to address in the first part of this webinar. How can ICT bring solutions to ensure that virtual um, students get benefits of mobility, such as experiencing international university life, collaborating with students from other countries, networking, etc. Well, time has come to invite our distinguished speakers to share their institution's relevant projects and initiatives on digital mobility. I would like to start with George Ubax, the Managing Director of EADTU, the European Association of Distance Teaching Universities. George, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. I hope you can hear me well. Um, yeah, I'm uh, uh, just uh, a short introduction. EADTU, uh, the European Association of Distance Teaching Universities, is actually covering um, uh, 25 countries in Europe uh, and a total of more than 200 universities working with online open flexible education and virtual mobility is one of our main uh, topics to work on. I'm going to share my screen now for a moment for my presentation. Is it uh, visible for you this way? I hope so because I, I can't see the, the Zoom uh, meeting anymore, but uh, I will go by the slides. Um, yeah, so uh, what we have done is uh, we are active in this field for more than 10 years now. Sorry, uh, dear George, we can't see your slides for now. Not a bit. Yeah, you can see it? Okay. Um, we cannot, George. No, we cannot. Sorry. Okay, uh, let me check. Otherwise, you have to do it via your system. Can also do it for you if you Just one more minute. Sure. You want me to share? Yes, please. Yeah. The only test we didn't do was <laughs> sharing my history. Now it's live, you Thanks. can go ahead. Thanks. Um, okay, yeah, so please, uh, next slide. The, um, what we have done within E2 uh, is working for more than 10 years now within um, uh, the topic of virtual mobility. Um, next, please, because I can't change it, yeah. And, um, uh, what you see is our two publications of uh, last year that we have uh, published uh, as we were focusing on this is that one is about the um, all the uh, well uh, theoretical approaches on, on um, and comparing mobility schemes uh, of physical mobility virtual mobility uh, distance education and so on in one document that's the right document on, on your right and the left document is the outcome of our um, uh, task force on virtual mobility and we have started this 10 years ago already but then uh, in Europe, the, the feeling was about virtual mobility um, being kind of a second uh, best alternative for physical mobility, as I would like to show to you also today, that this is really a complete different um, 
a concept that is more supplementary to physical mobility rather than replacing it. Uh, we have been uh, taking part and leading several European projects on trudge mobility and we are happy to see that in, um, in many of the European calls for university cooperation, trudge mobility is now uh, actually part and formalized by the European Commission. Um, next, please. Um, like I said, we had uh, a task force and here we only want to show you the, how many different universities are involved here, as well as some um, highly uh, reputative um, networks of the um, uh, European universities. Uh, they all represent uh, different examples. And the, the issue was that many uh, initiatives were called virtual mobility or virtual change or, or, or differently as nobody had a clear idea on what the concept now is and how to, to get categorized the different initiatives and activities in this field. And that's why we uh, launched this task force. And next, please. Um, the main task, uh, the task that we covered under this task force was to collect good practices within and outside our membership, uh, map new developments in the field of virtual mobility, and also see how virtual mobility can stimulate European university networks. It's the, the latest new thing within universities in, in Europe that the European Commission is funding uh, networks of universities working together in, in, uh, in the coordinated actions of offerings to students and organizing mobility between students and staff. So it's a really uh, highly relevant topic uh, in Europe at this moment. Next, please. Um, to uh, the publication that I showed in, in one of the first slides was then uh, first tested. Our outcomes were first uh, tested and discussed also in the broader audience of other stakeholders. So not only the universities, but also uh, broader university networks, public authorities, and agencies that are uh, responsible for student uh, exchange to come to a, uh, well, I think a full overview of uh, what is happening in Europe. And I'm now going to talk to, to you about more about the theoretical background of this, the framework. Next, please. Um, well, the positioning of virtual mobility uh, in the past was, well, we have a rich program of physical mobility by the Erasmus uh, Mobility Program in Europe. Uh, then we have network programs. Uh, this is all physical mobility, uh, joint degrees, embedded mobility for staff, all uh, physical mobility. But uh, the European Commission started funding uh, virtual mobility by initiatives for some, some five, six years ago. And, and now it's really integrated in, in the European um, programs for, for universities. Next, please. Here you see the theoretical background of it. So we're talking about virtual mobility. Um, it's about creating proximity involvement of potentially all students. Uh, at this moment, it's only a, a small percentage of students that, is pro that has the ability to have uh, uh, physical mobility. And by using new media, social software, uh, we create uh, better accessibility and activity and, and, uh, between universities and exchange of students. An important distinction here between virtual mobility and distance education, which I always need to explain because there's always confusion about this, is that distance education is based on a contract between a student and a university. Um, while virtual mobility is actually a contract, an agreement between universities. These uh, virtual mobility are fully facilitated mobility schemes organized between universities of which students can make use of. While distance education, the student takes the initiative of buying a course, following a course from another university. That is distance education. So we're talking about the, the bilateral agreements and the collaboration between universities of facilitating mobility for their students. And uh, in that uh, context, they, they also make sure it's pre-assessed, uh, the programs are coherent, um, and so on. So that is, um, uh, and also the assessment is done at the home university of the student. Even as a student follows a course at a different university, uh, the, the other university um, sends the, the, um, the tests to the university of the student and there the student uh, does the examination. Uh, yeah, next please. Um, elements of organizing mobility in, uh, uh, in collaboration between universities, we have done within another project, NetQ, Network Curricula. You see that you have to, when you collaborate with other universities, you have to think about all these in, in the blue blocks um, to have agreements on. 
on the uh, administrative aspects, the complementarity of content, how do you work with the community, uh, QA processes. So these are all the elements when you start working uh, together with another university that you need to cover. Yeah, the next please. Um, the definition that is used on virtual mobility by the European Commission and their calls is a set of activities supported by information and communication technologies, including e-learning that realize or facilitate international collaborative experience in the context of teaching, training and learning. Next, please. The main, um, main element here is that it is an international academic experience. That is the, the, the core goal. It's always related to a formal course and um, based on bilateral agreements guaranteeing the rights of the student. So it is, it is for the student like taking a course from its own university, but then from another university with the same rights, the, the same guarantees. Yeah, next please. Um, the basic principle behind this is that you can organize um, learning and teaching by offering it face to face, online, and in a blended mode. Uh, that is also what we're going to, what we're doing within mobility. Uh, next, please. Um, in mobility, you can have physical mobility, you can have fully online virtual mobility, and you can have a mix of that. that that's what we call blended mobility. Uh, they can strengthen each other by having uh, subsequently uh, virtual mobility, access to another university, then visit the university and stay in touch uh, later on uh, in a virtual uh, sense again. So that is, uh, these are the options in mobility. Next please. What you see here, when you put them next to each other, you see that when you are typically for physical mobility, it is short term uh, as well as long term, but short term is at least three months. It, it is funded by the European Commission on the basis of having an exchange for at least three months. As online and blended mobility can also be an afternoon, for example, eh, that you uh, or several days to follow a course of being um, involved in a peer group of students um, somewhere else. But that's a big difference. Um, physical mobility is by definition synchronous. You are at that university meeting the other students as Online mobility can be asynchronous. Right? It's, um, you can, you can uh, uh, work with uh, looking back at videos and so on. Uh, and typical for physical mobility is that you visit one campus, as with online mobility, you can have a range of universities, a multiple uh, uh, series of universities that you can, can visit to build your own um, a curriculum, so to say, to build your own program. Next, please. Um, yeah, and then uh, here you see four categories that we have identified based on the um, examples that we mapped within Europe. You have mobility that is part of a course, uh, so that, that within a course, the, the course is enriched by a short visit online to another university meeting other students, for example, or other programs. The second one is actually the, the, the classic exchange that the student uh, visits another university but now virtually. The third is that we are talking about network mobility, where uh, a student is not taking um, virtually a full program somewhere else, but is building its own program by taking courses from other universities. So windows uh, of mobility. And the fourth um, format is that you have integrated mobility in joint curricula. Then it is mandatory to follow uh, programs from different universities in a series to get your degree, to get your, your, um, your program together. So these are the four distinguished uh, formats of offering mobility. Yeah, next please. Um, that also means that you have to organize this differently. So here we have these four formats um, uh, next to each other. Um, in the first one, when you have mobility within a course, it is about uh, distributing teaching and learning activities over with partner institutions. Um, uh, and some, some more, I'm not going through all of them, but uh, these are the arrangements that you have to make for course mobility, uh, uh, mobility within a course, I must say. When you exchange mobility, it is the course taken as they are. The student takes a course at another university as the course is, it is not changed. In network programs, you really have to think about organizing this together in collaboration with other universities uh, to make the program coherent and, and the offerings for the students enriched by pro courses from other universities. 
and joint programs, you really co-own and co-organize the, um, uh, the program within a consortium of universities. That is the most strict uh, one for collaboration. Yeah, next please. Um, here you see that we have more than 20 examples. These are not even uh, all of them, but we have categorized these examples under the four formats that I just uh, mentioned to you. Um, this is also to be found in the publication, but we also have a dedicated website uh, on virtual mobility in which you can find all information also on these virtual mobility um, offerings by category. Below you also see related initiatives uh, because they could not be mapped under the four categories, which is the Erasmus Virtual Exchange Program and OpenVM. Um, next, please. One minute warning, please. So one minute only? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll go quickly. Um, but I don't see the slides anymore. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we were at the, at the examples and then we can skip this one and we can skip the next one because, yeah, this we can skip and this one skip. Then uh, I just want to uh, close with uh, what we have identified here as, as uh, what I said is different from physical mobility. Um, there is also some overlap, but there are several skills that you can um, gain from being part of virtual mobility team. It's intercultural skills, it is uh, network learning skills, active self-regulated learning skills. Uh, next, please. And um, very important also is uh, working in interactive collaborative learning um, in the international environment. We think that you learn by virtual mobility, the students how to coordinate a group, work on, on the same targets and objectives together in an online setting, which you can't learn from physical mobility. So uh, this is an uh, important part. I think now we can go to the final slide. Yeah. What, the message that I want to bring is that education can be organized face-to-face, -face blended and, and online. So, and so can it be within the different mobility schemes. None of the forms of mobility is an alternative for the other or replacing the other. They are uh, strengthening each other. They all are enriching the education of the students. And um, the sequence of physical blended and online mobility uh, is based on the principles of international curriculum and courses. You can play with that and, and make the program much more interesting for your students. Uh, the final sentence is purely for the European uh, participants. It's also an, uh, supporting the European universities initiative, um, which we call uh, the Open Youth Bloom Hub. But that's only familiar for those in Europe. Okay, thanks very much. I hope I've stayed within the time. Thank you, George. I will now turn to Ms. Chen Chiu Song the Deputy Secretary General of China Education Association for International Exchange, CAIE. Thank you, Charlotte. Good day, everyone. I hope you are all safe and healthy. Thanks very much for inviting me to participate in today's webinar, allowing me to share Chinese practices and learn from others. I believe the dialogue will benefit our work and enrich future cooperation. The mission of my organization is to promote mutual understanding, learning, and cooperation between China and the rest of the world in the fields of education, science, and culture. As a window and a bridge towards the world, we connect people by establishing bilateral and multilateral platforms and participating in global governance. We carry out standardization work and conduct accreditation for educational services as well. This is a picture of our big family. The COVID-19 pandemic has posed enormous challenges to all nations at all aspects since early this year. In China, the pressure on education system is not only extensive, but also diverse. China has 280 million students in schools and universities, 17 million teachers, and 270,000 international students, as well as 1.6 million students and scholars studying abroad. 
where we have been experiencing the largest social environment in the world and history by transforming teaching from offline to online at all levels of education. Meanwhile, making sure strict prevention measures are in place. To March this year, 423 million online education users constituted 47% of all internet users in China. Chinese Ministry of Education has introduced several urgent measures to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. The ministry launched the National Online Cloud Classroom, aired on February 17, 2020, a free online learning platform for students from primary and secondary schools. The ministry has also provided more than 30,000 online courses to colleges and universities across China, which includes 1,291 national taught brand courses and 401 library courses on ilabx.com. It also established 24 365 campus recruitment platform, which provides university graduates with free online 24-hour employment service throughout the entire calendar year. Xuetang Online, hosted by Tsinghua University, launched its MOOC platform in English version, and its RAIN classroom has been embraced by over 3 million teachers. During pandemic, all international travels have been paused, which also forced us to run almost all activities in virtual space via Zoom, Tencent Meeting, or other platforms created by tech companies and universities. Let me share with you several examples. China-France Mathematics Exchange is a math competition of senior high school students with Chinese and French math experts jointly designing a set of questions for contestants from both sides to take, to take at the same time. And CAIE organized that in the past six years in our collaboration with our partner from France. The program is based on the concept that math is a universal language as it goes beyond language barriers and physical borders and helps students enjoy the beauty of math. Since we're not sure whether students can go back to normal class and take offline tests together. The experts are developing an online contest as an option. How the new online multiple choices can still measure the analysis process of students becomes a new challenge. The one to one due degree program is jointly implemented by American Association of State Colleges and Universities and CAIE. Chinese students studied the first year and last year in China and studied in the U.S. for two years in between. Due to the pandemic, students can only take online courses. The program design has to be changed. To meet the new needs, we not only plan to launch a cross-border study and management online platform, build complete online curriculum systems, but also help universities in both countries to accept online credit transfer by credit accreditation. CIE's annual conference for international education and expo is a comprehensive co platform that combines academic seminars and discussions, policy consultation, information exchange, B2B and education expo. It used to gather more than 5,000 participants from all over the world in Beijing. This year, all activities will be moved online. It opens new avenue for communication, inserts a new angle in organizing large conferences, allows much more participation with lower cost. Developing international education exchanges online echoes the needs of reality when people cannot meet in person. Digital technology is able to connect larger population in a shorter period of time with broader impact. However, we need to reflect the premises and predictable questions of virtual mobility. The online study and exchanges requires advanced technology equipment and constructed infrastructure. 
Meanwhile, all the teachers need to uplift technology competence, and the evaluation of online learning outcomes needs to be further enhanced. New challenges appear too. We have to acknowledge the fact that online communication will not completely replace the experiences that actual people-to-people -people exchanges and immersed cultural studies could offer. The long time screen time will damage students' eyesight, and online courses cannot keep students physically fit. Parents must adjust to the new parenting patterns too, and personal data collected by the new technology needs to be well protected. Crisis contains the needs of opportunity in Chinese philosophy. We shall keep exploring new communication methods, preparing ourselves for any possible situations that could have emerged in the future. In view of the positive impacts of new tech in the field of education, I hope to see the following three perspectives take place. A real lifelong learning society will be formed. People are easily accessed to more quality knowledge. Learning happens at any time, anywhere, the key is to help people maintain high learning ability. With 5G and AI and professional guidance, international education and cooperation will provide more people with less resources, more stimulation exchange experience. And high tech companies, more and more high tech companies will join the education force to enhance equity and quality of education, together with governments, schools, social entities, and educators. Concluding my presentation, I have chosen three famous sayings from Switzerland, Brazil, and China, respectively. Swiss philosopher Henry Frederick Amiel said, Life touches us to push back the tide that threats to engulf us. A saying from Brazil means good will makes the path shorter. And the Chinese saying says, if there's a will, there's a way. No matter how far apart we are, as long as we stand with each other, we will embark on a journey to a brighter future. Thank you very much and stay well and safe. Thank you. Thank you for your insights. Now I would like to give the floor to Hael Ashwandin the CEO of Instituto Now. Thank you so much, uh, Charlotte. Are you able to hear me? Yep. Wonderful. We see your presentation uh, also. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so my name is Rahel Ashwand and I'm based between Switzerland and Brazil. So também falo português, if anybody wants to reach out in a, a later point. And I'm a co-founder of two organizations, which in the end um, works very close together, one based in Switzerland and one in Brazil. And we are uh, focusing on learning design, usually in the non-formal uh, setting, but we also work with some universities in Brazil. And our main focus areas are competence-based and personalized learning, virtual programs that create true connections. So it's really about bringing people together to learn from each other and develop competences. And we put a very uh, strong point on being inclusive and bringing truly diverse people together in our programs. We do that on the now side, so the Swiss side, usually through our own programs. And I'm going to share a couple of examples with you in a second. And on the Brazilian side, we work as a consultancy firm. So we usually help other organizations develop these uh, aspects of their learning offering. So a couple of examples. And um, this is a quick thank you also to the speaker that we're going to hear later on, um, Laurin from Movetia, because all three examples have been co-financed by uh, Movetia in the past. The latest program launched in the middle of the COVID crisis uh, at the beginning of this year is called Brumo. And the idea here was to create a program that allows young people to create life skills around being resilient, being able to connect with others and find purpose and balance in their lives. And we did that by bringing together different teams on different continents to play with and against each other in an online game where they really have an opportunity to develop competences in their real life. The Now Journey is our oldest program. And the idea uh, was when we created it, how can we bring 
young people from all over Europe and neighboring countries together so they can get a better understanding of how they can build bridges across differences. So it's not just about different cultures or nations, it's really about also the differences that we have within uh, each of our countries, the different uh, identities that all of us have. And here we worked around helping young people learn by creating uh, social projects in their own community and being connected with these other young people and being motivated or motivating each other mutually across uh, online platforms. And the last example uh, is a little bit of a different perspective. How can we equip uh, youth workers, teachers and other people, facilitators that work with education to have the skills and, and competences to accompany young people in competence development and online, how to facilitate meaningful encounters online. So we also created an online learning and actually uh, also um, uh, in-person event around what we call learning facilitation, which is our methodology. Now, Instead of just talking about myself, uh, I discussed with the Swiss Next team that I would like to do a little experiment with everybody. So for those of you who are currently doing something else, come back to the webinar because you're gonna have to get active in a second. Uh, we're gonna get, do a little activity to get to know each other. So we do a little bit of mobility ourselves and it's gonna go like this. In your Zoom program, please look for the participants button and click on it. Once you click on it, you should be able to find um, a icon called raise hand. It's either the little hand symbol or it's really the words raise hand written. So I'm just gonna give you a second to look for that. And I see a couple of people who are just raising their hand, so that's good. I hope you're doing that to test. That's exactly what it is. Good, now take your hands down uh, because we're gonna do the activity just now. Wonderful, happy to see this working. This is basically a game to get to know each other. So it's not very serious, but it's just to give you an experience of what is possible virtually, even when we don't know each other. So I'm gonna give you always two different options. And I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand when the option that you prefer uh, appears. All right, let's just try it out with an example. I think that's gonna be easier. And once your option disappears, please take uh, your hand down again. All right, test example. Are you more of a still water person or a sparkling water person? Okay, so these are the two options. And I really hope that all of you are not a buying bottled water person, of course, but that's not the question. So still water against sparkling water. And those of you who are a still water person, please raise your hand now. So let's just give me a second. And now my possibility to see what's what is going on has quickly disappeared, but maybe it's a, one of the Swiss next people could tell us uh, what's the count for uh, still water or Charlotte, in case you're able to see it. I would say half, half. It's half, half. Well, this was just the purified water. So let's see if the other people were, uh, oh. were are gonna vote for sparkling water. So who are the sparkling water people among you? one people for now all right i see marcelo is is in the count so who is the winner among these two options marcelo still or sparkling still i guess still water all right so those of you who like still water you know that there's a lot of people in this meeting right now who are just like you now this webinar is about mobility so i'm going to ask a very personal question about when you travel, which is, are you a person who takes pictures of the landscape and, and buildings, or are you a selfie stick kind of person? All right, so let's see. Um, again, first the votes for, raise your hand for taking pictures of buildings and landscape. 35, 40. 14. 42. 42, oh wow, that's a lot of people, great. And who is a selfie stick, selfie person? Let's see if they can Nine, be supported. 16. All Six. right, I think that's not gonna work out, right? So the not, definitely not a selfie crowd right here. All right, I think I have one, I have two more. The first one is another fun one. Are you a one alarm and I'm getting up person or 
I set myself three alarms just to be on the safe side. Let's see, uh, raise your hand for just one alarm. That's, that's enough. One alarm, 20, 23, 24, mm -hmm. 26, 7, 8, 9, 28. Wow. Final number. Good, then let's see. Raise your hand for I need at least three alarms or I snooze. I think the snoozers are also in this group. Ooh, only 25, 27. All right. I like the honesty. Everybody who is raising their hand right now, I really like the honest answer. Good. Marcelo, who won in the end? In the alarm category? Uh, I guess is the one alarm. Oh. Wonderful. Good. Yeah, I guess. Before uh, closing my contribution or my uh, presentation initially, I just want to ask one last question, which will connect back to my, my second contribution to this webinar, which is, are you looking especially towards virtual mobility because you believe it's a way to connect people? Or are you on the side of, no, you want to provide learning for your participants? I know this is not an exclusive uh, question, but try to decide on which one you uh, value more. So let's see for connection. Connection 25, oh, 27, 28, 28. 28, wonderful. And now for learning. Twenty-three. All right. So that's good because I'm going to talk a little bit about two, the both things, of course. But in my own opinion, um, the learning really happens when we can uh, bring people together in an authentic way. And I'm going to talk more about that later on. So thank you so much for playing along and having this very tiny insight of what is possible when we use technology in a way to connect people. Thanks a lot. It was very enlightening experience. Next up is Patricio Marinho, Coordinator for Strategic Partnerships for the Directory for International Affairs at CAPES, the Brazilian Federal Agency for Support and Evaluation of Graduate Education. Patricio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning for most of us and in Brazil and good afternoon, good evening for Shen in China. Um, first, I'd like to speak a little bit about CAPES, what she is about. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, yes, this one. Uh, CAPES is a public foundation created in 1951. It's linked to the Ministry of Education. And this mission is to expand and consolidate the, the postgraduate system in Brazil. And in the recent years, from 2011, it included also the capacity building for uh, teachers on basic education and distance learning. So next slide, please. Uh, its core activities include um, providing access for publications, scientific papers, to allow people to develop their research in the universities and, and postgraduate studies. Uh, can you change for the next slide, please? Hello, okay, thank you. And other than that, we also provide funding for scholarships, uh, research, uh, scientific research, uh, international scientific cooperation, and several other activities. And one of the main actions that CAPES uh, performs in Brazil, it's the evaluation and accreditation of all the uh, strict um, postgraduate programs. So basically, Basically, all the masters and PhD programs in Brazil must be evaluated periodically by CAPES. And based on this evaluation, uh, CAPES decides what amount of funding, what amount of scholarships and projects uh, each program, masters or PhD, can receive from CAPES, because CAPES is uh, mainly a, a funding agent. So next slide, please. Uh, regarding uh, saying that about the evaluations and how it influences the, 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 the problems in Brazil, I would like to give some examples on, on the activities we are doing currently at CAPES 
mainly they are focusing on the scholarship programs we have, uh, a few on the joint research projects uh, programs we have. And I can give you uh, an example, three examples actually, on the response uh, to help um, the, the, the situation of the COVID-19 on three specific problems. Uh, because of the, the pandemic, we had to receive back in Brazil several of our uh, fellows from, from our scholarship that were abroad. And also we couldn't send people that were supposed to start their scholarships abroad because of the travel restrictions. So we had some universities that are and, and research institutions that received our fellows, they started offering uh, activities by virtual uh, mobility. And we managed to make some arrangements in our agreements with the, the international partners to allow uh, our grantees from, from scholarships to uh, start or continue their activities uh, by virtual mobility. And why I'm saying that this is a, a, a thing that we did differently now, because in the current uh, regulations we have in Brazil and at CAPES, uh, CAPES is not allowed to pay for uh, a scholarship, for instance, uh, that it was supposed to be abroad if the person is not physically abroad. So we had to make arrangements. So we have, um, uh, next slide please, three programs which are with Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, uh, with Fulbright Brazil and with Yale University. And with these three uh, uh, programs, we made arrangements. So if the students or researchers got, got the chance to start or continue their activities uh, virtually, uh, the partners abroad would pay for the, the, the researchers to perform their activities because CAPES was not allowed to do that, is not allowed to do that in this situation. And as soon as they return their activities physically abroad, CAP is resumed the, 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 the funding. Um, also, next slide, please. Also, we have two special programs at CAPES. One is in partnership with the American Council on Education, which is called the Internationalization Laboratory. Uh, we are sponsoring three Brazilian universities for the first time in this program. Um, and these universities, they are doing several uh, uh, internal changes to allow them to have a more uh, uh, integrated and, and strong internationalization strategy. So one of the things they are focusing on is in creating uh, conditions to allow their, their curriculum to be more internationalized and also to include virtual classes both for undergrad courses and for graduate courses. So uh, I can mention the example of two of these universities, which is the State University of Maringá and the Federal University of uh, Goiás. And they are performing internal uh, changes in their rules and also uh, creating uh, virtual classes to allow having, for, for instance, mixed classes from student, local students and students from other countries, which is a, a very nice thing. They are just starting to do that now because the laboratory started uh, last year and is an ongoing activity. So it's a, a work in progress, but we already have some nice results from the report that they are uh, sending to us. And also we have, lastly, uh, 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 one of the, if not the major program we have at CAPES now, which is CAPES Sprint. And it has 36 uh, large universities in Brazil. They are developing their uh, institutional internationalization uh, strategy. And also including in these activities, they are doing several virtual workshops, classes, and also interviews. And one of the nice things is that uh, the incentives CAPES gives to this program is to help them and to, to simulate them to create uh, an environment that gives uh, free access to science. So most of the, the, the classes they are doing online or interviews with specialists, they are putting on platforms uh, they are for free access. So it's a, a nice thing that we, we want the, 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 all the production 
to be possible, uh, pos made possible to access for everyone, not only the communities in, in those universes, but also to anyone that wants to have access to the knowledge. Next slide, please. I, I, I think I was a little quick on my presentation. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to ask. And um, also, if you have questions, you can uh, send directly to my email, which is in the next slide. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Patricio. No problem in being quick, better <laughs> than the contrary. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your presentation. I would like to invite our last speakers for the speaker for this uh, first module, Lauren Redding, the project, who is project coordinator at Movetia, the Swiss Agency for Exchange and Mobility. Hello everyone, thanks for having me. My goal in these 10 minutes that I've got now is to give you a brief, honest um, insight into how we at Movetia see digital exchange and how we've implemented that. So I'm trying to give you very concrete examples to see what that is like. Movetia, oh, get to the next slide, there you go. Um, Movetia is the government uh, national agency in Switzerland responsible for exchange and mobility. So we are funded by the government and by the cantons um, to, to implement that. Our vision, actually the vision of Switzerland that we are working towards achieving is that every single young person will, um, as part of their education, once in their lifetime, be able to do uh, an exchange or a mobility um, abroad or, or internally as well. So that's what we're trying to achieve. And, and we do that by, by providing grants, by giving advice and consulting to all sorts of institutions of education and, uh, and um, by, uh, um, um, by working with schools and extracurricular, by linking up different institutions and sort of foster that collaboration. We do that, um, we've heard a lot about higher education in the last few presentations. Um, so we also support higher education institutions, but we enclose, um, uh, we have a broad understanding of education that includes all, all um, wakes of life. So that diversity gives us the opportunity to fund um, uh, exchange and mobility of primary schools, secondary schools, um, in vocational education and training, uh, which is a big uh, important sector in Switzerland as well. Also in the extracurricular, as in the out, out of school work and youth work, we try to support more um, exchange mobility um, and uh, going all the way up to, as you can see on that slide, to adult education, um, et cetera. So we really try to have that diverse um, picture and, and support exchange mobility and all of it. Um, the whole spectrum also includes uh, all different levels. So we support exchange mobility within Switzerland. You can see a map of, of, uh, of the country here with the different linguistic regions. So this is a, a chance we have that we want to use. So we, we uh, foster exchange between the different linguistic parts, but also going broader in Europe, we support exchange so that there you have the, the whole Erasmus program that we link up to as well, and also globally. Uh, I'm gonna spoke, speak a bit more about that um, in a bit. Now, Movetia and digital mobility. So the first thing that we had, that we offered, was a project called Alp Connectar, as the, uh, as the name says. So the idea of this um, project that was set up by different university of, of teacher training was to link up different primary schools in the mountainous regions of Switzerland. And by doing that with a blended mobility project. So they did also connect, but they had the chance to use software and digital tools that we provided um, including including uh, pre-designed classes, lessons they could use with, with their pupils to connect these different um, mountainous schools with each other. So that was the first approach we had to, to blend in mobility within, within our, our, our offer. Um, in the meantime, this project has been restructured and, and has been part of a bigger 
approach to, to virtual mobility. Another thing we did was to provide uh, software, uh, so free software and, and advice to schools and other institutions of education on how to do um, virtual exchange and digital mobility. So you can see the different, uh, some of the tools we provide. So you have Skype for Business, which has now become Teams, that we provided them for free. We have a cloud storage called uh, Storebox, that's the top right picture, um, that we offer them for, for, to exchange uh, documents, etc. And also a platform called Rialto, like that bridge in, in Venice, uh, which is a, a, a social media platform um, that was created specifically to, uh, to, for schools and uh, um, other institutions of education to connect the pupils, uh, the students, the teachers online for the purpose of the exchange or the, or the mobility. So these are the things that we offer for free. We offer a, a webinar as well for um, teachers uh, um, and youth workers, etc., to uh, give them tips on, on how to how to implement a, a digital or virtual exchange or a blended mobility where, where that is a part of it. The last thing that was actually a big moment for us was when we went global, as is a Movesio goes worldwide. So since 2018, we've got a, a project called the International Pilot Programme, where we support um, and fund specific initiatives that have a strong innovation aspect and connect partners around the globe with Switzerland. So, um, as Rahel mentioned earlier, the, the Aruma project that, that they are implementing was, part of, was funded as part of this program that connected uh, Brazil, Switzerland, and, and other places. Um, we have also school exchanges that took place uh, in, a, in a blended way between Switzerland and Namibia. We had a vocational education where we sent young entrepreneurs from Switzerland to China to meet with, uh, with um, students there and to, to learn about uh, uh, how, they, how, uh, how the different um, sites do their training and the, and the entrepreneurship aspect as well. And um, I also wanted to mention actually yeah, that this, this webinar that we're all part of now is part of a bigger project by Oikos, uh, this student organization, and uh, Swissnex that is also funded uh, as part of this program called uh, the International Pilot Project. So in some ways, um, all of you listening here are participants in a, in a virtual exchange program that, um, that we support. In higher education, it, it took a, also a specific form that was possible with digital mobility. So you can see on this picture, students from, from um, Switzerland, from the University of Applied Sciences in Zurich. Um, you have students from the um, Universidad Federal de Grande Durados in Brazil and also from the University of Agricultural Science in Bangalore in India. And they all came together um, as part of a virtual summer school that, uh, that was about tackling climate change through global learning. So together, um, during a few weeks, they worked on concrete initiatives to tackle climate change and also to, to learn to find new ways of collaborating virtually together. Uh, so this is another example that was possible um, in the last few years that, that we supported in the digital mobility field. Um, here I put one quote as well, one of the, some of the few words that I added to my presentation from a participant from Brazil in this project who says, I firmly believe this course through its interdisciplinary and multicultural character improved my critical thinking in addition to allowing me to interact and exchange experiences with researchers and other students from different countries. So we, we think this is actually quite a successful program and, and we hope that more and more of these initiatives will come up. Then uh, in Europe, we are located in Central Europe, um, linked to Erasmus, as I said. Then 2020 happened, um, as, as all of you also uh, um, spoke about and I'm sure we've experienced in, in different ways. Um, we summarized this with this little picture here where we said we do not want to have the little coronavirus there at the bottom to be our exchange partner. Uh, we said no to that. And of course, that meant that a lot of our projects had to be either uh, were cancelled that we supported or were postponed to next year, um, given the uncertainty surrounding international travel. But I'm mentioning this here particularly because uh, um, it gave us the opportunity that wasn't possible before to, instead of cancelling some of the exchange projects, we moved them online 
our partners decided that that would be an opportunity. So I want to show you some examples of, of how that was possible in, in, um, in our way. So we had, of course, in the Erasmus, so these are two students that we uh, supported. Um, they had to do virtual learning that was mentioned before, so I won't go into much more detail here. Um, about the European um, Commission statistics says that about half of all students continued their exchange semesters just uh, following their classes virtually. Um, in the extracurricular field, in the youth sector, for example, there's a project uh, by the youth organization Le Coccinelle in Switzerland that did a ecographics training course online um, where they learned about how to use digital recording for sustainability. So that was meant to take place in, in, uh, in uh, Switzerland, as you can see uh, in this picture. That's what is, was supposed to be with students, uh, youth workers from, from about 10 different countries in, in Europe coming together. Of course, that had to be cancelled. And, uh, and then the, this organization decided to do it online. So you see the timetable of, of what they're going to do online uh, on the top right. I'm just going to not going to delve into it, but basically they did a, they had this new way of always having about an hour of input by, an, by, a, by a trainer in the beginning, um, followed by a Zoom breakout session where they would actually talk about in smaller groups what they learned and how to implement that, do some exercises, followed then by some homework that they would, they would do uh, themselves or with some of their colleagues locally where they live uh, until the next module. So you can see it's seven modules, they spread it out over about two months, so they meet for a day, uh, do these sessions online, and then in between the modules, do some exercises, some, some reflection, some learning, and then meet again. So that's one of the possibilities that we had. Um, and we supported that as well, uh, financially and, uh, and uh, with advice. Um, given that I'm running out of time, I'm going to... Yes, I, heard, I, I thought you might say that, Charlotte. I'm gonna skip this. There's another youth project that took place online. Um, where they focused more strongly on the intercultural learning. And I'm just gonna to go to my conclusion here, which is to say that um, I hope you got the impression during the presentation that we embrace more digital learning, we support more virtual projects, uh, especially in 2020 now. And we hope that, or we think that this might be something that would stay so that that present that we have now about supporting virtual exchange and learning would maybe become the future as well. Uh, we see it not as a, as a replacement of, of physical exchange, but as a complement um, that was mentioned earlier as well. Um, we think that given that there's definitely more interest in that field, that this is something that we want to support as well. And uh, all types of exchange uh, at the end of the day um, contribute to that vision that I mentioned in the beginning of, of enabling every single young person to have one exchange experience in their life. Uh, so we embrace that this is a possibility and might start a new a new program where focus that focuses exclu exclusively on promoting uh, new ways of uh, exchanging digitally and virtually so stay tuned that might there might be more to come uh, later this year or early next year and the question i want to give in the ways you on the way with for you to think about is ultimately what what is mobility what do we define it you started off with a definition charlotte so I'm just carry on this thought, is, is it a mobility when you do it uh, virtually? Is it, can you do it locally as well? Um, so I'll leave you with that question and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you to all our five speakers for your interesting insights. We see that you have complementary definitions and experiences, so it's very enriching for us. Um, it's in the next section of the webinar, we want to focus on digital inclusion and see how to make sure that this virtual trend doesn't leave anybody behind. And more especially people from remote and neglected area. We have seen heard some examples already, but I would like to answer the guests to answer a set of questions. Without any delay, I would like to ask um, Lauren you've talked about uh, this experience with the mountain schools and uh, but in your opinion which are or will be the positive impacts of this digital inclusion um thanks thanks for that it's definitely a thing 
that we need to be very mindful of that when we move ahead with this virtual mobility programs that we don't forget about who's left behind and um, so the statistics that was published also by the EU Commission said that about 70% of participants think that the digital learning tools work well, um, which is a good thing, but that leaves about 30% who say it doesn't work well. So we need to address that as well. But when it works, um, and to answer your question, I think that the big advantage is that it is, is that it can accelerate, it can add, bring new people into the field of exchange and enable more people to be able to go abroad in, in a virtual way or in a blended way even, um, that were not, that couldn't do that before. Um, so it could actually, if done in the right way, if there is a right way is to be, to be determined, but if it's done in a way that it reduces inequalities instead of exacerbating them, I think the big advantage is, is that um, it can bring more people in. Another thing that I um, was working on, particularly in the last few months, is that, um, is that it can contribute to having greener mobility as well. So if you have more blended mobilities or even virtual mobility without the physical, with the physical part, um, I think we can reach so many more people without causing more um, CO2 emissions by the travel. So I think that's an aspect not to be forgotten as well. Um, that it can be a huge advantage in that regard as well. At the end of the day, I think my, my uh, feeling um, is that the, by making exchange mobility experience virtual, that ultimately makes it more in line with the lift reality that we have, and especially that young people have as well, which is uh, that we have this global outlook. It's a globalized world. We, we you know, know what's going on around um, the globe and in every single country and at the same time still having that local anchorage um, in, in your city, in your place, in your town uh, with, your, with your friends um, physical around you and your family but also friends all over the world and, and contacts. So I think in some ways it's an in, in, um, inevitability to have that blended um, form of exchange mobility as, as a reality for us because it simply is what most of the young people and I I suppose ourselves uh, live on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, Lauren. I saw Hel agreeing on many of the, the points that you raised. Do, would you like to, to complete or add something? Yes, I, I was definitely agreeing with Lauren um, in the sense of we moved towards virtual before, um, before COVID because we started questioning ourselves, how much is it really important to put people on a plane to have a certain experience and how much can we make that without the negative uh, environmental impact. And I think the inclusion part is a yes and a no. And I think Lauren also said that very nicely. On the one hand, it's an opportunity. And on the other hand, there's so many things that can go wrong when we do an exchange virtually uh, that we have to be very careful. That starts with people who have a disability that we need to be very careful what platforms and tools we use. Um, it continues with, um, access in terms of really technology. Uh, I remember one experience of ours from Rumo was that people who had an older cell phone, it's not always just about internet, people who had an older cell phone could not install the program on their phone. So we have to be also uh, aware of that. And lastly, and I think that's also very prominent right now with so many people being at home and in, in homeschooling, parents, but also right, parents are looking after the smaller children and older students. There is also a strong element of privilege, how much people are comfortable in sitting in front of the screen if they have a room where they can actually, you know, be privately and be authentically themselves while attending these kinds of uh, learning opportunities. If they feel comfortable online, if they had had the experiences before, you know, to speak up in, in, in an online setting, et cetera, et cetera. So there's so many things that we need to, we need to design for. Right. We need to design for inclusion. It's not going to happen just because we put it online. And I think that's important. Thank you. Uh, Miss Chen Chun-Song, I heard that you may have some uh, interesting ex experiences in the rural areas of China, if you would like to share with the audience. Yeah, I would be happy to share uh, one uh, project that we are doing now. Um, in China, every uh, subject teacher from uh, primary and secondary, they need to have uh, 550 hours in-service training uh, as a must to enhance their uh, 
uh, abilities. So, uh, you know, we have a large area in uh, remote and rural areas. And uh, we, uh, in the past uh, more than 30 years, we uh, are helping uh, the English teachers in rural areas to enhance their capacities um, in terms of the requirement for their in-service training. Uh, we call this project uh, like hand in hand summer training programs for the uh, English teachers um, in rural areas. Um, the, the main elements for the training is uh, enhance their language proficiency, uh, 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 teaching uh, methodology and enhance their uh, intercultural understanding, as well as help them to prepare lessons for the next uh, academic year. Um, this is our sort of a routine uh, work, uh, but uh, uh, due to the pandemic this year, uh, it's not allow us to uh, allocate. We used to um, allocate uh, international volunteers during their summertime to do their volunteer uh, teaching who are from uh, 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 English as their native language. So this year, it's difficult for us to allocate uh, international volunteers again and force us to put everything online now. So we happen to uh, find out uh, the best teacher uh, university, Beijing Normal University, they have the excellent English department. So they agreed to work with us. Um, I, I think they um, mobilize more than 30 Chinese professors, including uh, American teachers to move all these training on, online. And it's also helped us to enlarge the, uh, the trainees pool. And this year we finished 1,000 um, English teachers in rural areas from primary to secondary, from uh, eight counties of uh, four uh, Western uh, regions. So by doing that, we, we, we realized that it gives us a, a huge potential because they not only listen to the big classes lectures given by the, uh, the professors, they also have a group discussions, the peer discussions, and they also are asked to finish their uh, assignment online and submit it online. And all the Q&A sessions are freely and online. And in the past, the, the summer training program only lasted two weeks, but this time we extended it to six months. So one week intensive training, and then for the following half a year, these professors and tutors will be online to help them uh, to answer any questions. And they can also discuss with peers when they prepare lessons. So uh, we hope with the technology, we could put all uh, more qualified and quality materials, learning materials online, and. Uh, and also uh, reach uh, famous professors, experts in, teach, in English teacher training. And also, I think uh, we could also reduce uh, the past sort of logistic arrangements mm -hmm. and sa save more time to uh, have larger uh, impact. So uh, this is a quite a new uh, experience for us. And I think we are going to continue, not only in the English subject, uh, this, uh, to turn the face-to-face um, -face, uh, training up to online in the future, but also maybe in the future we find in other subject matters, um, experts, and then we can expand the impact to more rural um, areas. And by the way, I'm sharing a very exciting news. Um, this is our last year of 13th uh, five-year plan. And there's a goal of this five-year plan is to alleviate all the people living out of poverty. And the, by the end of this year, we're going to reach that goal, which means uh, there will be 800, 850 million people living out of poverty uh, over the last 40 years. And this is a, a big achievement. And we've always believed that education it's a tool for people to change their uh, future. And also the, the teacher education is also the fundamental, helping uh, students to receive quality education. So we're going to do that. Uh, we're also Thank exciting you. about it, but we're going to continue to um, give more support to the rural um, um, areas and hope uh, we could find sustainable way uh, to keep the program going and thank you i'm sure you will thanks a lot 
Thank George, you. may I ask you, uh, in your opinion, which are the biggest barriers to virtual mobility, especially in regards to digital inclusion? Uh, yeah, thanks. So, um, uh, when we had the, um, the peer learning activity, we asked uh, many of them uh, who are active in this field or are planning to be active in the field, uh, what are the, the main obstacles, the main barriers? And then uh, when we got a listing of that, we see that, uh, first of all, is that uh, offerings in digital education um, are not um, as, uh, as much available as you would hope for. Uh, so you also need to have online material uh, next to um, online meetings with peers, but you also need online material, which is um, not always there. Then there is a, uh, a lack of awareness, experience, and expertise in organizing virtual mobility. So we, we want to work on that by providing these, uh, these models and sharing these good practices. Um, further administrative issues and uh, linguistic barriers. Of course, within Europe, we have so many different languages. The materials are offered in different languages, which makes it sometimes uh, difficult uh, for sharing. Uh, then uh, people are mostly looking for, for English uh, available material and talking into international peer groups in English. Um, and then, uh, yeah, digital maturity is also mentioned. So it's also asking to, to take the full, um, the fullest um, uh, um, the possibilities and the benefits out of virtual mobility. You really um, are, uh, need some digital maturity of your university. So you, you see also that universities that are more leading in offering online flexible education are more, more willing in, um, in being part of these virtual mobility exchanges. So. Uh, but there are still some barriers, but uh, we strongly believe that the, the benefits are, uh, are there and um, uh, to, to further develop universities in this uh, direction. Thank you, George. We, I'm afraid we are running out of time, but I would like to thank you all for this um, enriching ideas for our debates that we will continue in a, in a manner um, taking questions from the audience. So I would like to start with Patricio. We have many questions um, from Brazilian researchers and, and actors. And one of them is, uh, could you give us your opinion on how virtual mobility will deal with the cultural aspects of international exchanges? Patricio, we can't hear you. You're Mike is muted. Okay, I'm back now. <laughs> well, um, one of the things that Tavis is, is working now, it's on providing a, 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 a legal background to allow our programs to include more um, virtual mobility. So we are currently, uh, as an example from those three programs we uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, which we had an arrangement specific for them. We're also working on a set of rules. So all the, the programs at CAPES will include this possibility for uh, virtual mobility in, in whatever situation is needed. And in this way, we hope to increase the, 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 the amounts of um, activities done as a, a internationalization at home uh, structure which includes also the, the virtual classes, uh, uh, virtual mobility. Uh, one of strat the strategies that CAPES think on applying in, 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 in the next activities, it's using internationalization at home, uh, virtual classes and virtual mobility as a way to prepare people uh, before, uh, in, still in Brazil, before they are going abroad for their actual uh, uh, in-person mobility, which is also something that we desire. But uh, past experience from, from past programs like Science Without Borders, that was very large, uh, taught us that if we are going to send everyone uh, abroad before they get the, the, even the language skills, uh, that's going to cost a lot of money. It's not going to be a, a, an effective uh, use of public funding, which because CAPES is a, a public foundation uh, paid by the taxpayers. And one of the strategies that we have now is to optimize the way that people do things, uh, 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 the way they prepare before they go abroad. So we want to 
have them as ready as possible. So they, when they go abroad, it's actually to do something that is going to be relevant for their careers or for, and also for the country because uh, the, the last goal of CAPES is to provide uh, conditions for improvement of people in Brazil and they can uh, improve our country. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Patricio. Um, also, do you, do you know if any of the universities participating in print program, for example, or even if CAPES has established a program, or a virtual mobility program? Um, the, the program uh, CAPES Print is uh, a program that is very wide. Uh, the university, they have a lot of autonomy to decide what they can do uh, uh, in, in their strategy. So, uh, I, I, I know there are some universities, they have a uh, uh, partnership with other universities and they already have like a, a co-curriculum which uh, in which they have uh, joint classes uh, doing, especially now I'm sure they are uh, doing some classes for uh, through virtual mobility. I, I know that the uh, State University of Rio de Janeiro has some uh, examples of that. I think one of the links I put in my presentation points to one of the activities done by the, this university on YouTube. Thank you. Um, we have also general questions that each of you can uh, address <coughs> when you are answering all the questions, for example, and probably mostly for the Chinese and Brazilian speakers. But what are the challenges uh, related to implementing virtual mobility at a continental level? And um, but I, I would like to start uh, to continue asking Hael, uh, could you tell me please about your assessments for personalized learning in virtual mobility? Yes, very happy to talk about that. So. Uh, Assessing the development of competences in our case or what people actually learn in a program that happens virtually is even harder, I would say, than if it happens offline, right? It's really hard to put the finger on what exactly you develop when you go abroad. Uh, in, in the classical student exchange, people would say, well, I made a lot of friends and, and uh, it changed me uh, completely. So we started looking at it in translating this into specific competences. So, you know, friendships can translate to being better in creating uh, inter uh, connections between people, being better to communicate, having more empathy, et cetera, et cetera. And today we try to really translate that into the virtual world as well. So we try to be able to uh, help other organizations in mapping out which competences are really being fostered in a virtual exchange program and we have developed a tool which is called the Now app, which helps in really measuring the competences and comparing and tracking this development. And it's especially something which we find relevant, yes, for the organizations, but especially also for the learners so that they understand how is this impacting me? And it gives them an opportunity and a motivation to engage more, to really take their exercises serious, et cetera, because they understand what they're getting back from this which I think sometimes is a little bit abstract. So it has been quite a successful tool for us in the past. Thank you, Rehen. Another question that all of you can address when responding is the language uh, barrier, how to overcome it when adopting virtual mobility, but it's just an idea for you to keep it in mind. Um, Ms. Chen, I would like to ask you, um, from we have this question from Marcelo Maya from Brazil who is um, asking if you could tell us more on the one classroom initiative to promote virtual mobility at senior high school level to embark a larger population oh yes I'll be happy to uh, share the thoughts on that um, one classroom project is a project that, I, that we worked with AFS intercultural programs. Uh, this is a program that uh, has been uh, over 70 years uh, history and more than 60 countries are country partners uh, of that program. So based on that framework, big framework, we, we are partner of AFS program. 
we propose and initiate a one classroom project in collaboration with um, around 13 partner country. So uh, the, uh, for instance, Argentina, um, uh, Australia, Brazil, India, Japan, Philippines, and et cetera. So uh, basically, uh, the, the partner country can produce uh, video clips and put it on the platform. So the other uh, partners on the, the same platform can share and use it. Uh, that's one uh, format of, of exchange. The other uh, format of exchange is like the, uh, the first short video that you showed at the beginning of, of, of our webinar. It's a uh, real-time uh, live um, streaming. And students were talking about culture, educational system, uh, the food, uh, and also sports. Uh, and they also choose um, common interest topics, for instance, related to SDG as well. So there are various kinds of topics. And by doing that, we bring uh, the students um, to share and then to understand this is to try to understand that the different ways of living, different ways of thinking, and also at the same time appreciate the, the diverse culture. I think people realize that we live in the same con on the same continent, but we same time at the same time face some common challenges. So we need to communicate. We will find uh, solutions all together. So this is a um, sort of a very good practices. Uh, also helping not only students, but also teachers to uh, have this uh, intercultural understanding competency. Um, because in nature, no, I mean, before the, the pandemic, the, uh, the, the main format of exchange of AFS intercultural programs are exchange high school students to another country and hosted by host families. And they, they, the students go to local schools and make new friends for 10 months and then they come back. By doing that, they, uh, they, they grow as a whole, I mean, more mature little adult. But the uh, pandemic, uh, I mean, gave us another kind of thinking of maybe we could use this uh, digital technologies to bring more kids, more families on this platform to learn by. Um, how to say, without meeting in person, but still have uh, exchange experience. Uh, for instance, we just finished one program with, um, with AFS USA. They um, supposed to send 10 students, high school students to China, but due to the pandemic, all the learnings are put online. We even find each of the students a virtual family. So as a virtual family member, they do things all, all together. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think, I also hope, I think the pandemic is just, uh, we, we will um, conquer and defeat the pandemic finally. And when that time comes and people are still wanting to meet each other and uh, chat and laugh and pat each other's shoulders, and that's totally different experience. But uh, this is also a new way, I mean, um, to bring more people at lower cost, uh, as some um, previous speaker mentioned, and it's also environmental friendly. And I think this is also a, a future trend. Undeniable, right? Um, we have one of the listener who's interested in implementing these practices in her university. And she would like to know what would be the first step, the practical step, in order to promote um, virtual mobility in her institution. Her name is Tiziana Mora. I think, George, maybe you can, you can answer. And if the other speakers want to compliment, George, about the next practical step to implement virtual mobility in Brazilian, I guess, Brazilian institution. Yeah, thanks. I, I think it's important that you have that you're organizing this uh, not because it's possible, but you have a really objective there. And based on your objective of organizing this, uh, you have to look at what kind of model or format you're looking for. So I put the, um, the website of uh, 
of virtual mobility um, uh, in the chat uh, um, earlier, but I can, I can do it again. Then you can uh, first make a choice of what kind of format you would like to, to start with and then have a, a clear objective, what are the, the learning objectives also for your students. I heard a lot of, uh, in the last uh, 10 minutes, a lot of, uh, uh, of course, very justifiable reasons of organizing virtual mobility because of the environment and also because of, of um, uh, uh, COVID and so on. But we must not forget that this is also enhancing education. It's enriching programs and so on. So I think uh, uh, um, virtual mobility is really also there as a new concept of, of learning. And that must be also the objective of those who are cho choosing uh, virtual mobility as a concept that we want, would like to explore and implement. Thank you, George. If anybody wants to complete, otherwise I have tons of other questions for you. I'm just gonna add very, very shortly, I'm even gonna share my screen here because it makes it easier. Um, we at Instituto now have just put together a very short list of best practices that we believe are useful for virtual mobility and we're going to summarize them on our blog very soon. So for those of you who speak Portuguese, feel free to uh, keep posted there and read up on what these different five things here mean. Uh, I've touched on most of them at some point of, of what I was talked about, but I think there's more for you to discover and we try to make it really hands on so you can uh, implement it uh, in your own organizations. Thank you. I'm sure it's going to help Tiziana a lot. Um, it, it, uh -huh. Do you know? So, yes, Sorry. please go ahead. Uh, I would like to, uh, because I, I, I know that we're running out of time, I want to share one, uh, a book. It's uh, an old book. It's, uh, uh, I think the, 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 the lead uh, expert is called uh, Monsieur Jacques uh, Deloy from France. And it was written in late 1990s. It's called uh, Learning the Treasure Within. And that proposed a four pillars of learning. I think uh, no matter what we are doing in online, virtual or offline, I think we, uh, we need to remember that uh, learning, uh, the, the purpose of learning. And also I think in that book, there is a, they, they uh, he uh, put very nicely that, uh, we, what we should do, what we should learn, what's the treasure uh, within the learning is uh, we need to, um, how to say, learn to know. We, we, we need to learn to do, to practice what you've learned, we've learned, uh, what we learn, why we learn, um, how we learn, and then we learn to do, um, uh, put all these together to put the knowledge into practices um, and also link the skills, what, we, we, what you will learn. And then uh, learn to live together, and that's so important. Um, and then uh, lear learning to learning to be, um, be a nice person, to be productive to uh, to uh, to the world. Um, I think uh, when we are doing all these teaching and learning, and these quite fundamental things that we need to remember at back of our, our mind. That's what I want to share with uh, with colleagues, and and also. Uh, when the pandemic is over, uh, we here in China are welcome all of you to visit us. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you also for uh, going back to the um, essence of education and what we want to achieve before implementing such virtual mobility programs. Anybody wants to complement? Um, if I may. Yes, sure. Uh, I'd like, first of all, and last of all, to thank everyone uh, for sharing their experiences. And it was really nice to hear from, from China, uh, from, from Ms. Chen, uh, the experience they are doing there, because it's a challenge that we're facing here in Brazil, too. Uh, we have schools uh, needing to provide uh, teaching for students locally, uh, but also virtually. And we have this uh, uh, difficulties with connectivity, uh, the equipment that the students have access. Um, we have a capacity building problem also because most of the teachers were not prepared to do that and they are trying to learn uh, to change the, the car wheel while the car is running, which is something very hard. And uh, um, I cannot say much about because it's more uh, uh, something from the, the Minister of Education, but 
uh, one of the things they are doing now is providing uh, uh, funding for the students to have access for connectivities using that, their cell phones and everything and, and trying to integrate more. But it, it's still a challenge because uh, it's not as big as China, but Brazil is also a continental country. And uh, I'd like to conclude my, my, my thoughts uh, saying that uh, all the, the internationalization at home, virtual uh, mobility and digital learning that uh, we, we, we discuss here is a, a very good way to help people to understand what they want to do uh, uh, next in their careers, in their lives. So as much as we can provide access to people for uh, virtual mobility, uh, the more they will be prepared when they go actually abroad or, or, or even to decide if they want to go abroad or if what they studied, it, it's enough to for them and they can move with their lives and do whatever they want. So I think it's a very uh, effective way of providing people on with conditions to decide what they want to do in their future future life. So I think this is most of the idea that I, I, I get from all what we discuss here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricio. Uh, last question maybe to Haynes, this round of, of uh, Q&A. Um, I, I would like to know if any of you knows of a funding program to support these virtual mobility initiatives. Uh, Lauren, you all already spoke about uh, how you supported HAEL uh, project, but do you know in your countries or internationally any funding available uh, to continue this uh, interesting trend? Maybe I can just start quickly by saying that under the, I've, I've, while, while you were talking, I was answering loads of questions in the Q&A uh, section on the chat and there I shared that link. I can share that in the main chat as well of our international pilot program. And on that program, you can actually do more of that. So, um, so yeah, check that out. You can, if you are an organization based in Switzerland or you have a partner in Switzerland, you can apply to that um, and submit your proposals at the beginning of next year. And uh, as I, I think briefly mentioned before, we might, we are currently in discussion of maybe setting up a new program later this year or early next year that focuses exclusively on virtual mobility. So stay tuned for that. Um, also check out our website and then um, you might hear more about that. It's not, no final decisions have been taken yet, but, uh, but it's something to, to maybe um, stay tuned for. So that's, I think for Switzerland, that's probably the best, uh, the best address to go to. Thank you, Lauren. Any other um, funding opportunity to help create and implement virtual mobility and focus on digital inclusion? So this is um, a topic that we will uh, pass on to the funding agencies, I guess. Thank you a lot to everybody for your participation. Thanks to the, to the audience for these interesting questions also that you, you shared. I would like to thank the presenters for their time and expertise. It, it was really an interesting and enlightening to hear you. Thanks to the audience for turning in also. If you want to experience a worldwide virtual mobility experience, check out and participate in the next Oikos and Swix next uh, upcoming events that you see on your screen called Next Gen Lead. Have a nice day and a nice evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Charlotte, for um, sharing this. And thank you for colleagues sharing your ideas and practices. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here, yes. I'm waiting to welcome you. Thank Have a good day. I also extend the invitation to Brazil for everyone and thank you very much for, for your time and your expertise. It was a very good experience for me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.